okay so this is uh, lecture what what somebody should tell me what was it before 33 32 okay so the last thing we were saying was uh, I mean we saw better be decoding algorithm and then i was trying to introduce recursive feedback convolutional encoders right systematic convolutional encoders which have feedback okay so the example i saw and uh, this is recap i took this very simple example where g of d i wrote as 1 and then 1 plus d squared by 1 plus d plus d squared okay so if you were to look at an implementation so you'll notice it's a very so one of those can canonical linear system implementations okay if you remember how this is done oops okay so if you remember how this is done uh this is how the encoder look like so if you have a message sequence u v0 was like in fact equal to u then v1 was given by that recursive equation v1 n plus v1 n minus 2 equals what am i right no v1 n plus v1 n minus 1 plus v1 n minus 2 equals u1 n plus u1 u u n plus u n minus 2 okay so that equation is satisfied by uh, this guy okay so this is the example that we saw and uh, if you draw the trellis okay so you will see the trellis will have different labels when compared to the labels that you previously had okay so the state transitions will be different previously we, we had simply a feed forward uh, encoder and you could write down the trace state transition all that very easily i think it's instructive to just see one example of that okay so i'll do the trellis for this and uh, just leave it like that okay so i'm going to use my states as s0 and s1 okay so that's my state so what is my output in terms of the state how will i write it down v0 is going to be equal to what going to be equal to v0 n is going to be equal to un okay there's no problem what about the other things how will i write v1 n okay so it's useful to have say some w for this uh, quantity here okay so v1 n is going to be equal to what wn plus s1 right but what is wn I'm sorry. U n plus s zero plus s one. Okay, so it's ultimately going to be equal to U n plus s zero. Am I right, or am I making a mistake? Okay, this is fine, right? So this is what it looks like. Okay, so why am I not happy with this? For some reason, I'm not happy with this. sorry yeah when you update the next state s1 will become s0 and s0 will become wn what happened yes so no okay do you like this or you don't like this don't like this i mean if you i'm sorry it's not in terms of you why no they ever do that no 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 do all that why
is this correct or wrong or what's going on yeah i mean zero is equal to w n minus 1 this one is equal to w n minus 2 there's no doubt about it. to get yeah should it be or not you tell me should not be no no no, no. why it's the same thing so what are you saying you're saying so is this fine or not how many of you how many of you like this and how many of you don't like this let me see a show of hands how many of you don't like this how many of you don't accept this Uh, at least one person okay so we'll go with this if at all there's an error we'll we'll see we'll fix that later so it will work something like this okay so when you do the next state s0 will become wn and s1 will become s0 okay so that's how you have to do the next state you have to be very careful about how you are doing the next state okay okay all right so let's see try to remember this when we do the trellis i'll do the complete stage of the trellis i won't do the i won't do the evolution okay so let's take the complete stage in that state i have uh, four states right so if i do a stage of the trellis <coughs> four states i'll call it 00011011 just to make sure we don't get too confused okay my state is written as s0 s1 okay and what are my two outputs v0 n equals un and v1 n equals un plus s0 okay and my next state is what okay so this w i have to compute w okay so i think to write down the next state i said s0 is w but what is wn wn is un plus s0 plus s1 okay so s0 next is un plus s0 plus s1 what is s1 next s0 itself okay so when you when you draw the trellis for these recursive encoders it's good to write down all these equations first okay don't think in terms of what which value of s1 i will use before or after or anything just write down at a particular time instant n when the nth input bit is being clocked in what are the different values and assume that these all these xor gates don't have any delay or anything they just happen immediately the moment this nth input bit is in all the xors will be immediately implemented only in the next after some time will the d flip flops get activated and the shifting will happen shift happens and it settles and then the next input is clocked in okay at that time the xors immediately act okay so that's how you so you should not imagine that when the input is being clocked in you will also operate the d flip flop okay so then you will get into all kinds of confusion okay so the input is the, all, the state is all set and nice when the input is clocked in you get the output after you calculate the output you execute your d flip flop clock so that it shifts okay so otherwise you'll be worried about should i use the previous value for s1 next value for s1 all these things okay so this is what this is what makes most sense and it's what i've written down here okay all right so you see the recursive computation works in a slightly involved way when you write down with terms of the states okay all right so try to go ahead and do it do it on your own i'm going to do it on the board i might go wrong i might be correct but try to do this based on uh, what you doing okay okay so always compute the next state first and then compute the output okay so is here that way so if you are at 0 0 and the input is 0 clearly the next state is also 
0 okay and the output is going to be 0 0 okay if you are at 0 0 and the input is 1 then the next state is going to be 1 0 okay I don't like that very much, but let, let's see. Let's see how it goes. Okay, 1, 0, and the output is going to be 1, 1. Okay, so you, if you are at 0, 1, and the input is 0, <coughs> the next state is going to be 1, 0. Am I right? Okay, and the output is going to be Zero, 0 okay so you see this thing requires a little bit of practice okay so if you did not practice this even once on your own when you see it for the first time in the exam you will have a tough time doing it okay so because a lot of intricacies here is s0 s1 this is the best way of doing it okay you can also do it without writing down these equations i believe you will get lost if you do that <laughs> but if you think you are comfortable doing that you can do that also but at the end of the day it's just a simple digital system so you should be able to do it quite fast Okay, 0, 1 and the input is 1, you go to you go back to 0, 0 okay. and the output will hopefully be 1, 1, am I right? Okay, so, so even at this point you notice the difference between this trellis and the previous <laughs> trellis, right? This trellis out of a particular state the two branches correspond to two different input values but the diff this is which is the same as what you had in the previous trellis but if you go to the right hand side if you look at 0 0 for instance its two inputs correspond to what 0 and 1 okay so that is very different from the feed forward case in the feed forward case that can never happen okay so in the only in the feedback case something like this can happen okay the two different there can be two different inputs coming into a particular state Okay, so that can happen only in this. Okay, go ahead and complete this. It's a little bit interesting. 1, 0, we'll go to 0, 1 with an input of 0 and the output will be 0, 1. Is that right? Can someone confirm that? Okay. 1, 0 with an input of 1 Did I make a mistake? Hmm? 1, 1 is it? Okay. When the input is 0? Okay. So, I think when the input is 1 it goes to 0, 1, right? So, input is 1 it goes to 0 1 what is the output 1 0 okay when the input is 0 it goes to am i right okay what about the next one so already at 1 1 you go to 0 1 with an input of 0 and the output would be 0 1 Okay, and with an input of 1, you go here, and the output should be 1. Zero. Okay, so that's how the trellis looks. Okay, but once you do this trellis, the Viterbi algorithm is as before. Okay, there's nothing different. Once you get this input and output done, you can always go back from output bits to output symbols. Given corresponding received values, you can always compute branch metrics, put it on the branch, then you can compute state metrics, you can compute survivor paths. The only thing that will change is when you store survivor paths as a sequence of states, from there you cannot go back easily to the message bit. Okay, so you you need some other function. Okay, that's all. But but it will correspond. Every sequence of states will correspond to a unique message uh, sequence. There's no problem with that, except that you can't just extract one bit out of the state to get the message that was actually sent. You can't do that. You'll have to do one more computation with it. Okay, so some simple computation only, but it needs to be done. Okay.
so that's the trellis for this uh, recursive code okay all right so once again when you want to write down equations like this remember that when you're clocking in the input the same the so the states are supposed to be fixed okay so you clock in the input do all the do all the xors then get the output out and then you switch your d flip flops shift it shift to the d flip flops and then you get the next input okay so that's the sequence in which things go here okay i believe that's the same thing you assume in any finite state machine when you do digital systems right otherwise you can't can't be doing everything together okay so that's the trellis okay so now i'm going to give is there a question no so okay so so previously we had a so one of those descriptions we had for the code words was using the generator matrix right using the g of d we could write every code word sequence that you saw as some u of d times g0 d and u of d times g1 d okay so even here we'll try to do the same thing but there will be some confusion okay so let's look at that very closely and see how to get around that okay so let me write down what g of d is once again okay so the generator matrix is what we're going to look at next okay so this g of d is 1 and 1 plus d squared by 1 plus d plus d squared okay so so what am i interested in when i encode when i am interested what i'm interested in is i know how many message bits i have right i would have some k message bits once i clock in the k message bits i start at the all zero state right you start at the all zero state okay from the all zero state you clock in your k message bits okay after that what should you do you should return to the all zero state again for that what did we do before we were just sending in zeros now it's not enough to send in zero see notice if you were at if you are at the all zero one state how will you go back to the zero zero state you have to send in one okay not zero okay so depending on which state you are in you have to clock in suitable bits to take you back to the all zero state so your termination will change slightly when you produce code words okay till you clock in your message bits there's no problem after you have clocked in all your message bits to take you back to the all zero code word it's not enough to just clock in zeros you have to clock in a suitable set of bits to take you back to the all zero state so that will change the way you produce your code words okay so what i'm going to say here is you said you send m termination bits okay these are not necessarily zero not all zero okay and then you go back to the all zero state okay for instance okay so it's very easy to answer this question for this example if after i clock in my k message bits i am at state 10 how will i go back to the all zero state what are the two message bits that i have to clock in 1 1 one, right see 1 takes me back to 0 1 and then a 1 again takes me back to 0 0 if i am at 1 1 what will i do 0 1 one. if i am at 0 1 what will i do 1 and then 0 right so well, you have to do two whether <laughs> you like it or not you have to do two right <laughs> even if you get to the all zero state so it's to keep the length consistent okay if i am at 0 itself then i do 0 0 okay so maybe maybe it won't work out uh, that badly but still anyway so that's what that's the description of the termination things that will happen okay so if you remember the trellis it will become two states and then it will become one state but already in that you have to do a zeros okay that's okay so that's what you get so when you clock in k message bits you will actually get k plus m stages in the trellis and k plus m times 2 in this case that many code word bits okay so all that remains the same let me write that down once again a k bit message u when it goes through a rate let's say 1 by i don't know what did i have 1 by 2 convolutional encoder okay just for example 
okay will give you if you do the termination you will get what 2 times k plus m code word bits okay same as before except that in the termination stage you will not be clocking in 0 you will be clocking in some other set of bits okay so there is a very nice way to describe this in terms of the generator matrix okay so remember what is the code word in terms of the generator matrix v of d is u of d times g of d right so which is in my case 1 and 1 plus d squared by 1 plus d plus d squared okay remember m equals 2 for me right in this example i am going through fully with an example but even in the general case it will be the same maybe we will see one more example for more general situation but it's the it's it's exactly the same okay so so in typically in the feed forward case u of d you think of it as only the message bits okay the reason is the termination bits are zero so even if you add the termination bits u of d will not change okay in the feedback case it's useful to add the actual termination bits to u of d right to add the termination bits to u of d when you add the termination bits to u of d now u of d will slightly increase in degree okay depending on what the previous values were okay a very convenient and nice way of describing that is to say i will take u of d to be okay u0 plus u1d plus so on till u k minus 1 d power k minus 1 which is the actual message and then i'll multiply that by 1 plus d plus d square okay so this this is purely generated by the message okay this multiplication by 1 plus d plus d square will take care of the actual termination that is required okay yes or no how many of you like this how many of you don't like this okay okay no <laughs> okay so so what will happen if I set u of d to be this? If I set u of d to be this, what will happen? V of d will be what? V of d will be what? u of d times 1 plus d plus d square. And then what will be the next thing? u of d times 1 plus d square. What is this encoding? exactly same as the feed forward case okay so if i set u of d to be whatever message i have times 1 plus d plus d square and feed it into this feedback encoder i will get the exact same mapping as i got with my feed forward encoder and the exact same list of code words but typically when you do convolution so okay so this is this is the let me first write that down exact same as Okay, so if you set this to be this exact same as feed forward case. Okay, so that is good to know. Okay, so but what's the difference? What happens when you set U of D to be something like this? What happens when you do this? There's something that you lose. There's one. There's one motivation I gave for this doing this recursive thing, which was yeah i am losing my systematic nature right so in the code word my code words my messages will not be there at all i am completely losing my systematic nature i am undoing everything that i did okay so what you do usually is you set u of d to be something else what you set it to be is something like this you set u of d to be u0 plus okay to retain systematic nature u1 d plus so on till u k minus 1 d power k minus 1 and then you add a couple of termination bits u k plus 1 d power k plus 1 okay such that okay these are your message bits how do you do this how do you figure out those two bits such that what 1 plus d plus d squared divides u of d 
okay so this whole termination returning to the all zero state can be described as something like this you add those two bits so that 1 plus d plus d square will divide this entire u of d okay so it's very easy to do that also actually you can divide this message thing by u of d which is actually by 1 plus d plus d square which is actually what you are doing in that feedback circuit and whatever else you have you feed back in through through as a reminder okay so it's it's a very it's, there are a lot of lot of theories behind how you do a, how you can accomplish division with shift register circuits okay so i think i mentioned this briefly during cyclic codes and coding also okay so so this is what you do okay another way of visualizing this is you look at the state that you are after you shift in your kth bit then send in whatever is necessary to get you back to the all zero state okay so even if you do this kind of a u of d you will only get the same set of code words as you got before but what will change the mapping from the message bits to the code words bit, code word bits will change okay see even if you form u of d this way you will only get all multiples of 1 plus d plus d square except that they will appear in a different form and you will get a systematic encoding okay so these are several ways of thinking about it and uh, you see the whole idea is to get a code word that will st stop after some time you know i mean after a while the response should stop right it's of finite length you don't want the code word to keep on going forever okay so that's the whole point of coming back to the all zero sequence all zero state okay so that's why we force the u of d to be a multiple of 1 plus d plus d squared everything happens very very easily okay so that's why when people define convolutional codes they would do something like this they will say i will only consider code words that terminate after a finite time once you do that you will see the convolutional code is nicely defined and you can have if you want a feed forward non systematic encoder if you want you can have a feedback systematic encoder anything you want you can have you can have different encoders all of them targeting the same code but with different mappings from your message to the Okay, so if you're not very happy with this, try a few examples. Take a very small value for k, take k equals four, and try it for this case, and do both the systematic and non-systematic. You'll see the actual set of code word sequences you get are exactly the same, but the mapping from message to code word is different. Okay, and all that happens because I'm terminating to the all zero state. If I don't, if I, if I didn't do that, then all kinds of crazy things can happen. Okay, since I'm terminating to the all zero state, only nice things can happen in my uh, description of the code. Okay, any questions? It has to be, no. Comes from division algorithms. If you take this whole guy and divide by one plus d plus d square, the remainder can have only degree one, right? And then when you add the remainder back to it, you will have to go back to the, so the remainder can have only degree one, so two are enough. Okay. So, so that's a brief description of this systematic encoding, and. Uh, and why you need feedback for that okay and uh, so slowly as i said we are moving towards turbo codes and systematic uh, non systematic feedback encoders play a very crucial role in the in the construction of the turbo code in terms of motivation okay so they are the reason why turbo codes really work and is motivation for that okay so for that I'm going to I'm going to give a slightly different example so that we we see one more example and then we ask the we ask the kind of questions that are necessary to move towards turbo codes. Okay, so this is the example I'm going to give. It's quite simple once again, but I want you to look at it. Okay, one and one plus d power four by one plus d plus d square plus d power three plus d power four. Okay, so this is my generator matrix. The first thing you can do is draw a shift register circuit to implement this. How many flip flops will I need? Four, right? So you write down the four and then feed back everything into the first XOR gate. Then pull out the first and the last one. You will get the encoder for this. Okay? So it's very easy to come up with an encoder uh, for this guy. Okay? So I'm going to ask a slightly different question. Okay? The question I'm going to ask is, okay, the following. Okay? So so it's it's motivated as I said by what's going to come later, but for now let's just look at this and ask ask questions to uh, ask questions to understand this encoding better. Okay, suppose I ask the question, what is the least weight code word that I can get with such an encoder? 
Okay, how will you answer that question? Okay, so the way to think about it is think of a u of d. Okay, think of a u of d which when multiplied will give you a very short code word. Okay, you know, not, not too many ones. Okay, when will this have a lot of ones? Okay, see, so what happens to the code word? What is a code word? What is the general form of a code word? When you multiply this with u of d, what is the form of the code word? You have u of d showing up in the systematic form and then u of d is going to multiply 1 plus d power 4 by 1 plus d plus d square plus d power 3 plus d power 4. Okay. Okay. So, if I take u of d itself to have a lot of weight, then what will happen? Definitely the code word will also have a lot of weight because u of d is showing up by itself in the code word. Okay. So, I should take u of d to be very low weight. If I want a low weight v of d, I should take u of d to be very low weight. But if I take it to be very low weight, what will happen to this guy here? Okay. It has to cancel. No, I mean the way I am thinking of my u of d. This has to cancel with this. If it doesn't cancel also, then there is a lot of problem. Okay, so it's going to go into some IIR type filtering and it will give you a lot of response before it dies down. Okay, so that's the problem. So you have to take U of D to be a multiple of what's in the denominator, and U of D should have very little weight. Okay, based on what you've seen before, what would you pick U of D to be? Some oh, I, I want least non-zero code word. <laughs> yeah, of course, all zero code word has got zero weight. I'm not good. I'm not going to dispute that. Okay. Non-zero code word of least weight. What's a good choice? Can you give me a choice? What would cancel 1 plus d plus d square plus d power 3 plus d power 4? It's very simple polynomial filtering, polynomial factoring. One minus. 1 plus d power 5, can I take u of d to be 1 plus d power 5? What will happen if I take u of d to be 1 plus d power 5? What will happen if I take u of d to be 1 plus d power 5? Yeah, you will get 1 plus d on the top, okay, and then the v of d will be what? 1 plus d power 5, what will you get here? 1 plus d power 4 plus d power 5 plus d power 9. Okay, what's the weight here? 6. Can you get anything less than 6? Okay, so maybe maybe it requires proof, but one can see that it's it's difficult to get anything less than 6, right? Okay. Alright, so it's also possible to study these things on the trellis. So one can one can come up with uh, a very very easy definition on the trellis to study these things. Okay, so what you look for in the trellis is you start at the all zero state, and how quickly can you get back to the all zero state? Okay, and what's the pa weight of that path which comes back? It's called a minimum distance error event, for instance, which is the same as what I did here. Right, I want to return to the all zero state very very quickly so i want to pick my u of d such that i'm sorry you can also find uh, hamming distance in the trellis right so the code word you can do that okay so if you for instance look in the trellis okay if i have to start at the all zero code word okay see i have to depart from the all zero code word so i can go to state 2 then i have to quickly return to what so why is that giving me 5 okay well this is another code it's giving me 5 okay so i've got 2 here and then one weight 1 here and then weight 2 here okay so i've got a code word of weight 5 with a code word of weight with an input code word of weight what 3 right okay so something like this will happen here also okay so you can also interpret this on the trellis if you want but a better interpretation is in terms of the polynomials, right? 1 plus d plus 5 is the smallest degree polynomial which will 
which will cancel out 1 plus d plus d square plus d power 3 plus d power 4. So you put that there and you get your least degree. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's not the it's not a rigorous proof, but one can prove it in this case. It's possible to prove that also in this case. Okay. So this is a this is a nice way of getting small weight code words from small weight input. Okay. So can you give me any other input, any other U of D which will achieve the same type of distance? What else can I do? Multiply by D, right? So that's a very standard way of getting more code words of minimum weight in the convolutional code. What do I mean by multiplying by D? What am I doing when I multiply by D? I'm simply delaying by input by 1. If I keep on doing that, I'll simply keep, keep getting the same thing again. It's it's a linear time invariant system, right? This is this filter that we have. So if you keep delaying it, you'll get the same output with the delay and the weight will not change. Okay, So I could set u of d to be some d power l into 1 plus d power 5 and I will still get a very low weight code word at the output. Okay. So, so what's the moral of this story? The moral of the story is if you have a weight 2 input separated by 5 positions, okay, then your code word will have very low weight. Okay. Your code word will have very low weight. Okay, if you have input separated by 5, that 5 is crucial. If it's not 5, then lots of other things can happen. Okay, so it won't cancel, you'll get uh, long code words. Okay, and what is the role of this delay? Suppose, suppose my message sequence is very large, like 1000. Okay, and I ask the question, how many code words of weight 6 I have? What is the answer? I can do 1 plus d power 5, and I can keep on delaying it till some 995 or something. So, the number of code words of low weight is going to linearly increase with my message length. Okay, right, right, and that 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 is maybe not a very nice thing. Okay, so if you have thousand, particularly for very long uh, number of message bits, if you go to thousand and two thousand, then the number of code words of very little weight is also going to increase linearly. Okay, so that is one of the drawbacks of the con of convolutional codes. Okay, because it's a linear time invariant system. Okay, if you keep delaying it by one position, all your code words will also get delayed and your number of code words of low weights this is actually this, this example I showed for 6 but if I find a code word of weight 7 I can do the same thing right I can keep delaying the whole thing I'll keep still getting more and more code words okay so the number of code words of low weight is, is a lot in number okay so what what happens because of that is when you try to decode convolutional codes you will see it will work only when you have reasonably good SNR but very very low SNRs even though the, you're doing ML decoding. Since there are so many competitive low weight code words nearby, you'll invariably make a lot of errors. So that's one observation that people knew from a long time back. Okay, they knew because of this linear time invariant property. Okay, convolutional codes have very many code words of low weight, right? Right, and that that causes a problem at very low SNRs. So when you want to try to achieve capacity with convolutional codes, you'll be stuck somewhere. You can't really get arbitrarily close okay that's mainly because of this this problem right yeah yeah increase but the number of forward with minimum weight increase linear yeah yeah so that's kind of an advantage right? i need more forwards with yeah i mean I, I agree with you i have to do this calculation very carefully okay but it can be done and you'll see this linear increase is not not very nice. You don't want even a linear increase. Okay, you want really the low weight code words to drastically go down, and uh, that's that's not a very nice thing. Okay, so it can be there. One or two can be there, but it should go down. It should go down. The lower, the better. Okay, and another thing to keep in mind is the the minimum distance here is not all that high. You know, I mean, six is not very high. You know, I mean. So that's another problem. So you don't want too many of the code words to be there, very close by then you can go wrong in so many ways and it goes by. I know it's not a very rigorous statement, but that's the best I can do given the situation that we are in. Okay, hopefully it's intuitive. You can see you can see why that works out. Okay. 
So what's needed is several things. Okay, so if you have to take convolutional codes and move them into capacity achieving scenarios, okay, so you need to somehow break this linear time invariance type thing. Okay, so as long as you have the linear time invariance, things will not not work very much. That's one that's one lesson you can get right out of this very simple uh, simple logic. Okay, so let me let me write down a few more things that are required if you want to move towards turbo codes. Okay, so moving towards turbo codes requires a few few other few other observations. Okay, first observation is LTI is is bad. Okay, it's, it's, uh, hurts. Okay, so it's, it's not good. Okay, so you have to break this linear time invariance. You have to do something else. Okay, not just uh, shifting and XORing. Okay, something else has to happen. Some something which is which will make it not time invariant. Linearity maybe is not a bad thing, but time invariance is a is a is a more hurtful thing. That's one thing. And the second observation is you might remember when I introduced LDPC codes, I said so far. As far as reed solomon codes were concerned, we looked at very solid constructions, deterministic constructions. Once you started with LDPC code, I gave a little bit of an argument for why you needed a random element in your construction. Okay. So what's missing in the convolutional codes clearly is some random element. Okay. So you need a need some random element. Okay. And uh, the third third notion is third notion is so it's great we have ml viterbi decoders for convolutional codes when we do all these things when we introduce some random elements and when we kill the time invariance you're not going to be able to do the ml decoding okay so if you go back and remember for ldpc codes what did we do we had a bitwise map type decoder which was reasonably efficient to implement in an iterative fashion okay so you need some such suboptimal iterative decoder okay so all these things put together will take you towards take you towards turbo codes from convolutional codes okay so there's one more thing that is required uh, just to uh, I think it's it's important when you read convolutional codes to know about puncturing because what what's usually done is I've, I've so far described only rate half codes Okay, you might say why you only rate half codes. Maybe I need a rate 4 by 5 code, rate 6 by 7 code. And then what will happen? If you need a rate 6 by 7 code, what would you do? Okay, you can't have six different inputs coming in and I mean it will just become ugly. Okay. So what is done in convolutional codes typically is something else. People do puncturing a lot. Okay. So you do just one rate half code and then you puncture it. You remember what is puncturing? You drop some parity bits okay so that's a very common idea and that's one missing piece that we will need when we talk about turbo codes also okay so the way convolutional codes are punctured this is the following okay so usually you start with a rate half code okay so when you do a rate half encoder what happens you have one input u and you have two outputs i'll take a systematic case okay so usually people do only systematic encoding it's possible to do non-systematic also. If non-systematic puncturing is a little bit more confusing and all that. So I'll do just systematic version. Okay, and then V. V is my parity uh, bits, right? So if I have my message bit U, I'll have the same message bits coming here, and then I'll have a parity bit, right? For every message bit, I'll have a parity bit. I'm doing a rate half encoding, right? So what people would do is, you take, say for instance, U1, U2 so on till u8 you take 8 bits okay correspondingly you would have 8 parity bits so you would not send 4 of the parity bits so for instance a very simple thing that you can do is you can drop v2 v4 v6 and v8 you can decide to puncture those 4 bits then what does your rate become 8 by 12 which is 2 by 3 okay suppose I want to achieve a rate 4 by 5 3 by 4 okay for instance maybe you take more bits you take like 20 bits you have 20 more parity bits and then you puncture suitably to get a better uh, rate and it's very common to puncture these alternate type bits and there's also optimal puncturing patterns people have done a lot of research 
and if you search enough you will find optimal puncturing patterns to go from a particular red half code to some other red code okay so it's possible to have red 7 by 8 for instance okay so this is a very common way of doing uh, going to higher rates in convolutional codes okay people typically never design high rate convolutional codes directly okay you do functioning okay so now the important question to ask is what do you do at the decoder okay so fine if you didn't send this bit but at the decoder what am i doing how will i compute the branch matrix okay i need this bit i need a received value for this bit to compute branch matrix right what will i do what do you do at the decoder what what can you do think of something what received value? I need a received value. Equally probable. So, what received value I should take for BPSK? Zero. Okay. So, simply take received value zero for those bits which were not transmitted. Okay. So, that is what you do. Okay. Set received values. Okay. In the BPSK case, remember if you have something else, maybe you will have to do something else. But typically, zero works in most cases. Set received values. I am sorry. Yeah, for the punctured code, yes. Received values for punctured positions to 0. Okay. So, you see, <coughs> when I do this, <coughs> you, have to, you have to be careful about how you puncture, right? So, you see, in the puncturing pattern, typically, people will never puncture consecutive bits. Okay, so I'm setting my received value to zero, which means I want to put a lot of gap between my puncturing so that I get good branch metrics on for successive stages. In any two stages, I at least in one stage, I should get proper complete branch metric, right? If I keep losing my branch metrics because of this puncturing, let me at least lose it sufficiently far apart so that I can adjust for the uh, paths as I go along. Okay, so that's that's those are some intuitions you can use when you pick the puncturing pattern but as I said people have done research and these puncturing patterns are available out there so you don't have to recreate them on your own. So most standards for instance if you take the LTE standard or 3GPP or any of those standards they will give you the puncturing pattern so, so you don't need to do any more work right. So typically that is always given. Okay. So this is one thing. Another puncturing thing which is very common which we will use. The receiver also knows the puncturing pattern. It's decided beforehand which bits are punctured. Yeah, that has to be decided. Otherwise, it's not love. You might ask then the question: how, how does the receiver know what the encoder was? You know, <laughs> it's all decided ahead of time. Okay, so you can't uh, change it anyway. So okay, another thing which is very commonly done to get rate half from rate one by three encoders. Okay, see rate one by three and all is not too bad, right? You have only one bit stream coming in. You encode more and more. It doesn't seem too terrible. So that is also very easy. You can do it very very easily if you have a rate one by three encoder. Corresponding to a message, I have the message sequence showing up in the systematic form. I will do it for 8, but I guess you can do it for any other length. Okay, So, maybe I will do it for n, Okay, just for, just for fun. Okay, u1, u, u1 to un. Okay, I will have my first punctured bits as v1, 1, 2. No, for first parity bits. I am sorry, why am I saying punctured bits? My second set of parity is to be v2 1 2 v2 n okay these are my two parity sequences and the, and the message sequence that shows up on its own okay so a very common thing to do is to puncture alternate positions in v1 and v2 so for instance in v1 you would puncture what puncture 1 3 5 so on here you puncture 2, 4, 6, so on. Okay, so rate will overall become half. Okay, so every alternate bit you take from the other thing and rate becomes half. Okay, so puncture after puncturing rate is half. Okay, so while moving towards turbo codes, this is useful. I mean, as in uh, this is typically done when you when you do turbo codes, you puncture a little bit to get uh, better rate. Okay, that's one thing. And the other thing, missing piece before we go towards uh, turbo codes is we saw an ML decoder for convolutional codes. There is also an bitwise MAP decoder for convolutional codes, which can be very efficiently implemented. 
okay so it's it's based on what's called the bcjr algorithm or the forward backward recursion if you have done uh, digital modulation and if you're doing digital modulation coding now i think it's been done for you already maybe in the context of equalization but even there they just have a trellis so the same thing can be done here as well okay so i'm going to give a very very brief description of what that is and simply tell you input output for it what is the input to that block what is the output from that block okay so i won't do anything more beyond that okay so <coughs> bitwise map decoder <coughs> for convolutional codes okay so after we do this we can move towards the definition of turbo codes and then go on to talk about the turbo decoder okay so i think we should be able to do this by this class okay so so what is the overall big picture right so you have you have say a rate i'll take a rate half uh, encoder just for uh, just for simplicity rate half encoder and maybe it's systematic i'll take it to be systematic just for so it's no it's no reason why it should not be so so the u is getting encoded into u and v okay so that's what that's what happens okay in the encoder now this goes through say bpsk awgn and you receive i'll say r0 is the vector received corresponding to the systematic part and r1 is the vector received corresponding to the parity part okay okay did you see that clearly maybe i should write it once again okay so r0 is the received vector corresponding to the systematic part and r1 is the received vector corresponding to the parity part okay so now the what's the what did we do in the viterbi decoder we maximize the likelihood of receiving r given over all code words right we did an arg min or arg max arg min of distance which is the same as arg max of the probabilities right so that's what we did in the viterbi case what should you do in the bitwise map case you should compute what okay so i i'll take these vectors to be u1 u2 un kv to be v1 v2 vn then same thing for r0 and r1 okay so it's unfortunate i have to write down so the whole thing like that but you see right i'll just take those to be vectors so what do i compute i'm trying to compute okay bitwise map decoder tries to compute what okay something uh, like what probability that what ui equals did i usually do 0 or 1 okay to do 1 1 given r0 r1 okay so this is what you have to compute okay and this bitwise map algorithm for the convolutional code will compute this way okay so it will it will take in r0 r1 and the say the trellis of the convolutional code some description of the convolutional code and it will output all these values okay so typically we don't think of this value right what is the value that we usually use okay the likelihood ratio in fact the log of the likelihood ratio so i'll denote that as lambda i i don't know what i've been using before for the log likelihood ratio maybe capital l l i yeah? okay so maybe we'll be consistent with that i'll say capital l i okay the a posteriori i used capital li yeah? and for the a priori i used small li did i do that okay so that's fine so log of probability that ui is i'll take did i take zero on top probably took zero on top okay r0 r1 okay if you don't like the r0 r1 collect them into one received vector and call it r okay so it's fine it's the same thing ratio ui equals 1 given r0 r1 okay so this is what the bitwise map decoder will compute okay so i'm going to make a few remarks about it without going into great detail okay so the way it works is very much similar to the bitterbi decoder 
Okay, so remember the VTAB decoded. It starts with the all zero state at stage one, and then proceeds stage by stage all the way to the last stage. Okay, so and stops there and it's able to output the ML path. To get the probabilities, that is not enough. To compute these probabilities, it turns out you have to do a backward recursion starting from the final state, and then come back stage by stage and compute further things very similar to what you did in the forward recursion. Okay, so what happens is you compute uh, what are typically denoted alphas and betas. Okay, for each state you compute alpha and beta at each stage, and then there are these branch metrics in the middle which are called gamma usually, and then for each of these probabilities become simply alpha, gamma, beta, some over several things. Okay, so that's how it works. Not going to explain anything more beyond that. Okay, I don't think it's necessary in this class. If you're interested, you can do it. I think most of you might be familiar with this already. That's what you do to compute these probabilities. Okay, what I'm going to do on the other hand is to show you how to split this probability in terms of the a priori probabilities and the a uh, in, in terms of just ri alone and the remaining outside of ri intrinsic and extrinsic not a priori intrinsic and extrinsic like i did for the uh, for the block code case i want to just do, do it in a very general term uh, in the general way to show you that this thing will actually split into a priori a, into int intrinsic and extrinsic the term that depends only on Ri and the term that depends on everything, everything else other than Ri. Okay, so it can be done. It's not too difficult, but I'll just show you very quickly how it works. If I get stuck, I'll just stop everything and give you the final answer. Okay, <laughs> so we'll see how it works. Okay, so the way it works is the following: you look at this probability R0, R1, and you write it as you use base rule and you write it as what? What do I want to write this? I want to write this as <coughs> okay. So another thing I'll do just to simplify my notation is I will set this to be uh, R0 R1 okay. And uh, if I write Rn that actually denotes R0n R1 no Ri okay. I'm sorry Ri. It actually denotes R0 i n R1 i and if I write R uh, let me say not equal to i okay so I guess this is the notation what does it mean what does it mean yeah so you start with R1 R2 you go on till R i minus 1 and then you jump to R i plus 1 and go all the way till the last last guy which is maybe n. Okay, <coughs> R not equal to I. Okay, so that's a maybe stupid notation, but well, it'll help me a little. Okay, it's a simple notation to understand uh, what is it that we're doing. Okay, all right. So now the first thing in base rule is to write this as uh, Ui equals zero comma R divided by f of R. Now f is some suitable PDF. Okay, so You'll have to calculate it uh, based on based on what you have. Okay, the next step is to is to do something with this. What do I do? Okay, so I'm going to say write this as I want to write this as okay. Of course, I can write this as U A equals zero. R i and R not equal to i divided by f of R i R not equal to i. This second, right? It's no problem. And uh, what do I want? Next. Okay, so I have to do some conditioning now. Okay. So let me try this conditioning. I think this should work. Okay, let me go to the next page. I think this conditioning should work. I'm going to say f of u i equals. Did I put zero or one? I've been putting zero or one. Zero. Okay. Zero condition on what? Let me take. R not equal to i condition on R i. That work? 
what am i doing i'm sorry what happened oh in the next page okay no oh, i'm trying to just think my well think my way through before i get stuck in the middle so let me just see it work out very nicely so i want a conditioning on i think i want conditioning on r not equal to y but I'm a little bit confused about whether or not okay so i don't care about the denominator that much but the numerator should work out okay so i want so want ui given ra so let me just condition on i think maybe i should condition on both okay so let me erase this let me try let me try what happens if i condition on both okay let's try to condition on both r ri r not equal to i multiplied by oh i'll go back to the same thing huh? so maybe i don't want this it's very it's a very simple derivation except that since i did not i think maybe the best thing to do is to just give up on this and give you the final answer but uh, let me just think it's it's not too difficult it can be done if i do this hmm okay okay so i think maybe maybe i'll look at it it's just, i mean it's not it's not a very difficult derivation except that i'm so close to the so close to this thing it's going to get uh, more complicated if i try to do this okay so you, you can you can work with this i'm i'm sorry i'm not able to fill it in just don't have too much time so maybe maybe i'll come back next class and give you the actual derivation it's not too difficult so if you do that <coughs> at the end of the day you'll get this very nice simplification li will become 2 by sigma square times ri which will correspond to your intrinsic llr and then plus this other guy okay so what is this other thing you can say that will be log probability of ui equals 0 given r not equal to i okay so it's a quite some it's quite a simple derivation for some reason it's refusing to occur to me immediately okay so maybe i'll give it one last try just to see if i can do this and then we'll just stitch this derivation and keep going for okay yeah i think we'll just ditch this okay so it's not so crucial so so try to try to work this out by yourself so this is very important in the turbo decoder okay so we'll use this over and over again and uh, make sure you can write that down carefully and get this okay so this this you can see is the intrinsic part and this will be the extrinsic part okay so it's it's quite easy to see this but Uh, for some reason my my derivation is getting stuck somewhere out there okay so so if you have any bitwise map decoder which is giving you li okay that li can be split into the intrinsic part which corresponds to the received information at that stage right so wait how did i get this there some problem here is it r0 or r1 i think it should be r0 no yeah it should be ri0 and then yeah i think huh change the definition yeah this should actually include yeah okay so anyway so looks like i'm i'm a little bit confused about this r0 and r1 so so you can write the li that you get finally as 2 by sigma square ri0 plus whatever else is remaining okay so i think I'm a little bit confused about the, whether the parity part enters here corresponding to that I think it enters here I'm not very clear about that but anyway so this is what you do okay so this is the this is what the bitwise map decoder is going to do okay so the input to the bitwise map decoder is r0 and r1 and the output is okay so you put a bitwise map decoder and the output is going to be okay li okay so i'll call that vector l which is 
L1, L2 to Ln and remember each Li can be written as 2 by sigma squared Ri0 plus the L extrinsic. Okay, so this is this is this is the high level picture of what the bitwise MAP decoder is going to do for you. Okay, so it takes the received values corresponding to the systematic part and the parity part. It computes the bit uh, the APP log likelihood ratio, which with some work can be shown as split into 2 by sigma square Ri0 plus extrinsic, whatever else is, uh, whatever contribution you get from the remaining uh, bits. Okay, so so this is the this is the only thing I, I want to do about the bitwise MAP decoder. If you're interested, I can give you other references. Okay, so fine. So that's that that I think should should be enough to jump into the turbo code description. So I'm going to describe the definition of turbo codes now. Okay, so it's actually a very very <coughs> simple uh, simple definition at the end of the day. Okay, so the version I'm going to describe. Is what's called a parallel concatenated turbo codes. Okay, so this is the version that I'm going to describe <coughs> describe uh, today. Okay, so there's also serial concatenation and all kinds of modification to it. You can do so many other things, but the version I'm going to describe is parallel uh, concatenation. So I'm going to draw the diagram and leave you with that. <coughs> I think. Uh, that's all we'll have time for today. Okay, so this is how the encoder is going to look. So you see the random element will come in and you'll see the time invariance will be destroyed in the way the encoder is done. Okay, so you have a message U. Okay, so one part of the encoder will produce simply the systematic part. Okay, so you'll take a recursive systematic encoder and the top part goes through. Okay, so there will be encoder 1. which will give you the parity part, so the first parity and then what you would do is interleaving. Okay, I will represent the interleaver as a as pi. Okay, so that is my interleaving. So think of this as k bits. Okay, so this would be k bits again. Okay, so this is a rate half encoder, systematic encoder. So the number of parity bits it produces is k bits once again. Okay. So then you do an interleaving. What do I mean by interleaving? You take these k bits and permute them in a different way. Okay, and then run it through another rate half systematic encoder. I'll call it encoder two, and it produces v2, which is again k bits. Okay, so that's what we would do. Okay, so this is a random interleaver, maybe pseudo random. Interleaver. <coughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. All this is known at the decoder. Okay. So, so as I've written down, this is a rate one by three encoder, right? Overall. Okay. So then, how do you, how do you get rate half, for instance? You can puncture. Okay. So typically, you take something like this and you puncture, say, the alternate bits of v1 and v2 to get your uh, rate half. Okay. So first thing that you can see clearly is introduced is the random element and why is the time invariance lost? See, yeah, the whole thing has become a block encoder and just because you shift and then there's a huge interleaver in the middle, you don't know what's going to happen at the other output. Okay, so the shifting may not be maintained very nicely through the interleaver. Okay, so you should design the interleaver so that it's very random and it's not going to be maintained. Okay, so those two properties have been killed. So 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 hopefully this will have. I'm sorry. Well, the question is, do turbo codes achieve capacity? They come pretty close for some bits. There's some some more logic. Too. Okay. I'm sorry. It's it's random. So just pick it to be some random. It should not be a regular interleaver like you delay by two two or something. It's all just a random permutation. And it can be any permutation, right? So actually, this is not one code. It's it, it's actually an ensemble of codes. Keep the encoders fixed. You change the permutation, you get different codes. So, so it's in that way, it's it defines more. Okay, so we'll stop here and uh, I have to run somewhere else. So we'll we'll pick up from here in the next class and maybe I'll fix that derivation for you in the next class. Okay.